Well, good morning, my friends. Uh, I trust that you are all well. Um, pray that things are going well for you and your homes and your families. Uh, I know this has certainly been a trying time, continues to be in so many different ways, and we're trying to make our adjustments as we go. Um, and while there certainly is no replacement for our time together in face-to-face -face community, um, we certainly want to do our very best to provide something for you online that you can find a way to connect to and encourage you to, to check in here, make some comments underneath as the video is streaming, uh, just so we know that you're there and interact with each other and go back and do that again. We're trying to make the very best of this that we can. Uh, I know some of you have asked some questions um, just about some of the normal things that take part in a church service. So uh, communion is obviously something we do together. It's uh, a little difficult to do through video, but I encourage you to just take some time at your own home. Uh, take a few moments and uh, find whatever emblems you can to represent that uh, body and blood of Christ um, and share in that uh, in your home with your families, by yourself, wherever you might be. Um, I would encourage you to practice that um, and to do that as part of your faith. A couple of you have also uh, reached out to ask about uh, wanting to take part in an offering. Um, and if you would like to mail that to the church, you certainly can. Our address is here on the Facebook page. Um, again, I recognize this is a tough time for all, but that's just as, as you're led to do that. If you feel like you want to do that, you can certainly mail that to the church. And then we may be looking at some other options for those that are interested here in the near future. But my biggest concern today um, is just to come and hopefully share a word of encouragement for you. Um, and I want to hopefully help guide you through some things that we can do together, that we can share in together. You know, last week was Easter Sunday. Um, we certainly not the Easter any of us imagined, as we did talk about. And uh, you can follow that message if you want to see that. That's on our Facebook page or also on our website. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting to just kind of see how even this continues for us. Um, and you think about the church then and what that looked like, how they were all kind of coming together. And I think there are a lot of adaptations we're having to make as we still continue to practice in isolation. Um, I, you know, I've, I've worn contact lenses or glasses since I was in the third grade. Uh, so my vision has not really been good for a long time. Um, and I kind of realized recently that my prescription has expired. Um, and this happened in the last couple of months. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I kind of got the, the warning of it. Hey, your prescription's about to expire. You need to come do this. And I thought, well, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And then everything kind of fell off the, the rails, if you will. So I, I haven't had that done. Um, and I know that I need to get that done. And when things reopen, I'll go get my new prescription. And I find it interesting that every year when I go, um, it's interesting to see how my eyes have changed because they always do. And as when I get that new prescription for contacts and glasses, how much more clear I can see. Uh, and, and you don't even recognize it when I'm in the middle of that year, just kind of bumping along. But it's, you, know, you kind of had this moment of clarity when that vision is renewed. And, and I think the same thing happens to us, that, that our vision kind of drifts a little bit. And, and I think that happens because of just life events, the things that we're dealing with, the, the current circumstances that we're struggling through. Sometimes that vision drifts because of personal choices that we've made, things that we've done that have kind of pulled us off the, the path. And it impacts that vision, sometimes without us even realizing it, until we can have a moment that helps us to refocus and we realize where it's gotten off the rails. We, we realize that we maybe what we thought we were seeing clearly isn't as clear as we once perceived. And, and I think about the disciples, especially as we come right out of Easter, and you think about the group of people and the text that we're going to look at today, we're, we're going to see these disciples on the very same day in the passage that we looked at last week. And, and, and for us, a week has passed. For them, it was the same day. And now that we're in quarantine, it kind of feels sometimes like a day is a week, <laughs> at least it does to us right now. But what we're going to read this, and, and I kind of unpack it a little bit for, for who we are and kind of apply it to our circumstances, our situation today. But, you know, I, I, was, I kind of struggled through this a little bit because you think about what these group of guys and, and, and women are going through, um, the, the things that they're struggling with. But again, it's just words on paper to us. Um, and, I, and I don't know, the, the thought just kind of hit me this week that scripture for us is two dimensional, but life is lived three dimensionally. And I think for us to understand a little bit better about what God's trying to offer, we, we've got to think about the, the people that were involved in this. And this is just isn't a story. This is the actual lives of people, the emotions they were feeling right in the middle of this. Their doubts and fears and anxieties and concerns. And as we're going to see here, a little bit of joy and some hope for a future. But I, but I want us to recognize that, that this is a life lived 
And that those same things can be pulled out and applied to us, even though we're separated by a couple of thousand years of history. So let's look at in John chapter 20, uh, and we're going to look at verses 19 to 23 today. Um, and, and you may recall, if you were watching last week, that, that we talked about how Mary and Peter and John, in the verses just before this, had gone and discovered that the tomb was empty, and, and that Mary had had an interaction with Christ that he had been right in front of her, had communicated to her. So here we are on that very same day in verse 19. It says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You want to think about this group of people. And, and, I, and I don't know, I'm, it kind of helps me to understand to maybe enter into the things that they were thinking and feeling. Again, moving beyond the, the two-dimensional words on paper to the three-dimensional reality of the lives being lived. And, and I would imagine that they're still very afraid. I mean, this, this is here it is, that first day of the week. It, it's only been a few days since their entire world fell apart, since Jesus was captured and brutally murdered in, in front of a public crowd. So I'm sure there's still a lot of fear with them. And, and they connect together here, and it talks about that doors being locked for fear of the Jews. But I think they're all still gathering because there's this shared bond that exists when you've endured trauma. That you have this shared connectivity with a group of people who've been through things that are similar to what you've been through. And, and I think they're certainly experiencing that. And then in the middle of it, Jesus shows up and proves that he is alive. And then they have this great joy at once they, what they once thought was lost forever, and now they've regained it. But, but I love how, how Jesus takes this excitement that was created, and he channels it. He takes their enthusiasm, this joy that they're having, and then he directs it into something with so much more meaning than perhaps they had actually anticipated. What he's actually done is he has refocused their vision. You know, there, there's an expression when we talk about vision in terms of, you know, where you're going and your destination. We say that vision leaks. And vision leaks, meaning that, you know, we have this out in front of us of what, who we want to become and, and where we want to go and what we want to do. But we drift away from that. That vision leaks unless we constantly refill it. You know, I've, I've had some clunker cars in my life, um, and I've had a couple of them that had oil leaks. And you just, instead of fixing it, you just kept oil in the back of the car. Maybe you had one of these and you had to constantly put oil in. Or maybe you had a water leak, something in your car where you were constantly refilling. And if you didn't, then your car stopped working. You found yourself on the side of the road waiting for somebody to come pick you up. Well, vision is the same way. If we don't constantly refill that vision, if we don't constantly channel our energies and our thoughts, then we miss out on that. See, it's the presence of Christ that helps us see our lives more clearly. The presence of Christ helps us see our lives more clearly. He refills that vision for us. He did it for this group of people then, and he's still doing it for us today. And we just need to engage with the presence of Christ to let him make that transformation in who we are. Because what we've seen even just in these four small verses is that all of God, is completely committed to renewing our focus. All of God. We see all the parts of God in these four verses. We see the Father that has sent the Son. We see the Holy Spirit coming on these people that as Jesus breathes out on them, he, he infuses them with that encouragement and that energy and that power. All of who God is is completely invested in this. And what Jesus is doing is bringing their focus back to where it belongs. But I love the very first thing he does for them is that he shares the peace that their souls are desperate for. That's the very first thing he offers to them. If you go back to verse 19, if you're reading along, it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands. And then again in verse 21, he says, Peace be with you. 
He offers to them the exact thing that they were missing. He fills in this gap in their souls because I, I feel fairly confident, even though I'm not one of these disciples, I wasn't there at the time, that there was probably a lack of peace in their soul, that they weren't feeling very peaceful in that moment. There was a lot of fear and trepidation, a lot of anxiety. Perhaps you can identify with that, right? We're feeling some of those same things right now. And Jesus instead says, listen, I'm going to bring my peace to you. And then it says, after he said this, he showed them his hands inside. So here he shows up in the middle of them in this locked room. And instead of immediately offering proof of life, instead of immediately offering proof of what he's going to do, he gives peace first. And, and I think that's such a beautiful illustration of how God gives us what our souls need to begin with. Right? He understands that the deepest part of who we are, that, that inner part of who we are, our soul, our actual existence, that needs comfort sometimes, that needs encouragement and strengthening sometimes. And God offers that to us first. See, this, this peace that he's talking about, and it's such a simple word for us to say that I offer you peace. But what it actually means is to be at one again. To, to bring back together something that was disjointed. Um, I've, I've shared the illustration before that if you've ever had a, a dislocated finger or seen somebody with a dislocated shoulder, there's a lot of pain. And when that is put back into place, back where it belongs, there's a sense of relief that comes, right? That, that pain diminishes and things actually feel better. Well, that, that's exactly what Jesus is offering. He's offering this sense of, of bringing things back together to restore what was once out of place. And when Jesus speaks of peace, he's offering peace, and it's this peace with God so that we have a sense of, of, of identifying with him, of feeling at one with him. It's a sense of peace within our conscience, that it makes things right between our mind and our heart, our mouth, our body, the things that we choose to do. He brings all of that back together. And then ultimately, that means peace with each other, that, that we share that with one another as we are in shared community together. So, so if I were to describe what that peace actually is, and we get it on a theoretical level, but, but what is it? I, I think peace is a sense of calm and fear. And that doesn't mean that we don't recognize that there are threats. That doesn't mean that we ignore the reality of what's happening in the world around us. I just think it gives us a sense of calm in the middle of that fear. I think peace is something that fills our heart and our mind when there is a need. And that even as we look to have that need fulfilled, there's still a sense of, of level-headedness, of, of even spirit, if you will, that we have in the middle of searching for that need. But ultimately, it's about comfort in the sense of a higher power. It's about understanding that there is this eternal God who continues to watch over his people, all of his people, all who carry the divine spark of creation, and that he is there to help guide us through this. Because I, what I really believe what Jesus was doing, he was not just offering peace for that very moment. Maybe there was a heightened sense of need in that moment for peace, but I believe he was offering peace that would continue. It's a, it's a constant comfort of peace. I you know, I've heard it described this way, and I really like this, that, that peace was the legacy of Christ. Bringing things back together, reuniting, making one. And that for those who choose to follow the pathway of Christ, peace is an essential part of our vision. That same vision that Christ is renewing. Peace is an essential part of that. And, and the, the beautiful thing about peace is that peace can be contagious. And the more we have it, then the more we can share that. And it actually starts to ripple through people. And that becomes the biggest characteristic of this movement of Christ, is this sense of peace of things being made one again. But, but he didn't stop with peace. He, he also renewed their sense of purpose. He gave them some direction. I mean, let's be honest. Their plans had changed drastically. 
They're standing in a position where they didn't think they would be standing. This was not the path that they had chosen for their lives. This is not where they thought things were going to unfold. And, you know, it's kind of like all of us who bought 2020 planners, right? Those 2020 planners aren't real effective right now because it's, you know, home, 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 home. Right? Easy to fill that out. But I want you to hear this. Even though their plans had changed, God's plans had not. He was still going to move forward in his purpose. If we, if we go to verse 21, after Jesus offers peace, he says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I am sending you. He's saying, listen, there's this shared power and shared mission. The Father sent me here for this period of time to do this, and now you're going to carry that on. You're going to continue to fulfill that purpose. And this comes with this idea of authority and a higher calling. There's great power in that idea of being sent. He's saying, listen, as the Father has sent me, I send you. When we talk about being sent, it's about traveling under someone else's name, not incognito, not in disguise, but with the authority of this other individual that carries you forward. If you've got a, a letter from the governor of the state saying, listen, the governor has asked me to come do this, I'm not operating under my own authority. I'm operating under the governor's authority. Well, Jesus is saying, listen, my father sent me, now I'm sending you. You are moving forward with purpose, and you're moving forward in a direction that is exactly where you should be going. And what he's asking us to do in all of this is to publish peace to the rest of the world, to bring things back together. If you go down to verse 23 that we shared, and he says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. He's talking about part of our greatest purpose is in sharing the message of God's forgiveness and bringing things back to this idea of restoration, making things right. In fact, it's called the ministry of reconciliation, if you want to kind of get from a biblical term. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, Paul writes this, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, that's a lot of words, but let me just tell you essentially what that means. There is this separation that takes place because of sin. And God says, listen, I, I'm coming to bring all of that back together again. And I came and I did this through my son. And now I'm asking you to continue to carry that message on. So perhaps the greatest message, part of our purpose, is not in trying to separate things, but instead bringing them back together, of making things right, of making things whole. And that's because I really believe that there is a deep peace in being forgiven and in forgiving others. See, this is all connecting, isn't it? This, this peace be with you really is the message we continue to carry, the message we continue to to share, and can we carry that forward? It, it, to me, it's kind of like the idea of a relay race, if you will. Um, the, the, Jesus has kind of been running. He ran that first leg. Right now, he's kind of reaching back and handing us the baton center. Right, let's carry this thing forward. But he doesn't quit running. That's, that's the unique thing that kind of falls apart in the track illustration, is that he continues to run with us as we carry that message along. He knows that we don't have to do this by ourselves. That this is our purpose, to share that message of bringing things back together under the loving grace of God. And that's where he says, I am sending you. But you notice what he does next. He says, I'm sending you. And then he gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit helps to travel with us. That the Spirit guides and powers that mission. Because in, in, in the presence of Christ, where we find that refocused vision, that renewed vision, we discover that Jesus gives us the energy to keep moving forward. In verse 22, he says, receive the Holy Spirit after he breathes on them. Well, let's be honest, in today's current economy, we don't want anybody breathing on us. 
But in this spiritual context, there's this deep passing of the life of God. You talk about that idea of breathing. There's this, this physical part that took place way back in the book of Genesis, right? Where, where God formed up man and he breathed into humankind the breath of life. And now Jesus breathes on them as well. There's this, this wonderful synchronicity of this coming together. To me, it just shows that God has got us covered completely inside and out. He's providing exactly what we need inside and out, and it is the life of Christ. But I, I, there's this word in here that's really important. Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. He, he didn't tell him, you're going to take it, whether you like it or not, end of the story. No, he says, receive. That means we've got to put ourselves in position to receive. There's got to be a willingness to accept the gift of God. Because the breath of Christ signifies the power of his grace. That's what's being offered. This beautiful grace of God coming through Christ. And to do God's work, we need guidance. But we also need the power of the Holy Spirit to make that a reality. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit that determines our sentness, right? He says he sends us. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit that determines that, not intellect and not ability. Isn't it, isn't it comforting? It's comforting for me, right? You don't, you don't have to be the smartest in the room. You don't have to be the most talented in the room. You just have to trust that God is giving you what you need to fulfill the task that's in front of you, that he's giving you the strength that you need to be able to accomplish what he's asking you to do in that moment. This is a cheesy illustration, and I'm, I'm sure one you may have heard before, but if you, I, I like to think of it like Star Wars, right? I'm a Star Wars fan. I enjoy all of those. And you think about the force, if you will, that this life force exists, that it is in the universe, it is put out there as something that's, that's just being able to be tapped into. But what it takes is an awareness and a willingness. And I don't think the Holy Spirit is the force by any stretch, I do think that the same principle of our awareness and willingness to receive what God has for us, that's the key to connectivity. That's the key to being fueled and powered by who God is. And the disciples were being given power and strength and courage to do what must be done. That's not a whole lot different than it is for us, my friends. The Holy Spirit, even today, gives us strength, gives us understanding, gives us purpose, gives us peace. The, the question is, are we open to receiving it? Are we willing to put ourselves in that position to recognize who God is, to engage with him on a consistent basis to receive this gift that he has for us? You know, I said this just a few minutes ago. All of God is invested in us. All of God. He doesn't hold back. Divine creator, Jesus in flesh here is that model for us, laying out a, a pathway of actions and words and character for us to follow. And then the inspiration of the spirit that brings that sense of calm brings that sense of endurance and helps us to continue moving forward. And I think that's why Jesus came here. One of many reasons, but one was to show us the pathway to walk. You've heard it said here before that one of the things Jesus came to do was to show us how to be better humans. He came to walk a pathway for us that if we choose to follow that, we too can offer the gift of peace we can start to reconcile, to bring things back together that are disjointed and separated and spread out and instead bring it back under the universal blessing of the divine creator. God is leading us to do some things for him. And, and I don't have the definition on what all of those specifically are for each of us, but I, I hope that we can understand that we are sent out under his name. And that if we follow the words and actions of Jesus, that we can make an impact. 
So as we talk about some of these things today, my friends, I want to ask this question. We, we talked about peace. We talk about purpose. We talk about energy and that Jesus provides those as we are seeing our lives more clearly through him. But which of those three, peace, purpose, and energy, do you need the most of right now? I mean, can, can you identify which one it is that you need most? And maybe you say, um, it's not one. I need, I need all three. I need all three of them together. Well, I, I want to encourage you in this. Sometimes we, we kind of live life with a scarcity mentality, believing there's not enough. God operates with an abundance mentality. And he's got plenty of all three of those for you. And if you need more peace today than you did yesterday, he's not rationing it out. He'll give you what you need if you're ready to receive it. If you will just ask and receive, he promises that that will happen. And if we think about the idea of offering peace, of moving with purpose, and having the energy of the Holy Spirit as our fuel that moves us along, can you imagine our community if our entire church operated under those guiding principles, can you imagine the transformation that would take place? The presence of Christ helps us see our lives more clearly. It was true for the disciples then and the path that they were about to start moving forward on. And it's true for us in the path that we are currently on today. And if we believe that to be true, Maybe if you just believe it a little bit. How does that renewal of focus that we've seen in this text, and in this interaction today, how does that change your approach to life right now? How does that change your mentality and the things that you're going to do? And then how does that change us when we can all be back together again? That sharpening of focus because of the presence of Christ, once we all gather in that, how does that move us forward? What, what I want you to know today is this. I want you to know that you are forgiven. Receive that forgiveness that God has for you. Know that it is there. Receive the spirit of God that he gives us, that fills us from within and then comes out in the very air that we breathe, the words that we speak, the way that we treat others. And my friends, be at peace. Be at peace. Let me, let me pray. If you would please join me in prayer. Christ, we thank you uh, for your constant presence that brings us peace. Um, you clearly see the needs of our souls and uh, you continually fulfill them in ways that only you can. Today, we receive your comfort, your guidance, and your energy as you lead us forward. And may we be encouraged through what we face because of who you are and how you make all things right again. Thank you for loving us first and for showing us how to love others. And we pray this in all the names of God. Amen. Well, my friends, I certainly miss seeing you face to face, uh, but appreciate the time that we can at least spend together here online uh, on Sunday mornings. Um, please let us know about needs. Reach out through our Facebook page or email call, text. Um, don't be afraid to share those things that people can pray about from a distance as we continue to try and take care of each other the very best way we can. If you have physical needs that need to be met, don't, don't be bashful. Uh, reach out. If you need help with groceries, if you need help and assistance in any number of ways, please send a message, send a private message if you'd like, but don't, don't ignore that and, and don't, don't think that the church doesn't want to meet those needs in this moment, in this crisis, because we do. We care about you and we want to help each other. No matter what state you might be living in and how you might be doing things, we are here to help. And uh, let me also just share this. You've heard me say it before. Find ways to encourage each other through this. Uh, call, text, write a letter, send an email, uh, connect online. Find ways to encourage each other and let's maintain community even if we can't do it in physical proximity. And uh, my friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Be blessed.